Welcome, we are so happy to have you. My name is Levi, and here at Faith Center, our mission is to reflect God's presence and release generations. Um, before you watch, we just wanted to remind you that we're posting things here all the time, whether that be burning questions, or sermons, or more sermons, and we want to make sure that you get notified every time something gets posted. So be sure to subscribe. Uh, and if you're looking for prayer or have questions, please be sure to connect. We have some buttons down below um, where you can reach out. Um, and as well, we have some buttons down there to give. If you are like, I'm bought into this vision, I love what Faith Center is doing here in the community, here in Eugene, um, and you want to partner with us, please feel free to click that uh, giving link. Um, now, grab your journal, grab your cup of coffee, uh, and I'm so excited for what the Lord has in store for you today. Um, all right, let's jump into the message. Um, are you, you going to stay up here for this one? Here. Yeah. Okay, we we're, we're going to do this together? Yeah. Today? Yeah. All right. <laughs> we're excited. Um, this is Anna. Did you introduce yourself earlier? I'm Anna. Anna. And uh, we are married. We are in a relationship. Yes. And uh, we are going to jump off today on a five-week sermon series on relationships. Mm -hmm. Relationships, which we're really excited about. We've been talking about this and praying about it for a while. Yeah. Let's just let everyone know, this is, is this a marriage series? This is not a marriage series. Not a marriage this series. This is a mother, father, son, daughter, friend, coworker, sibling, anything relationship series. Yeah. We're just up here doing it together because since it is a relationship series, it makes sense for someone in a relationship to deliver the messages together. We just thought that was logically consistent. Sure. And um, we're really excited about this. Like we said, we've been praying about this. Um, we've probably, we've been married for coming up on 10 years. And yeah, thank you, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and obviously, as we all know, any relationship takes a lot of work. Marriages take work. Uh, for the first two years, it was good. It, it was, was good. It was good. <laughs> and then year three, we started putting in some work. We started putting in the work. We needed to work. And we needed the work. Yeah. And for the last seven years, we've really been investing uh, significant time and energy and prayer um, toward cultivating healthy relationships. So that's the title of this series, Never Walk Alone, Cultivating Healthy and Whole Relationships. Um, we have five principles because really it's just, it's just five Sundays and you'll master it, right? After these five weeks, you will have nailed every relationship. You will have nailed relationships. You won't need anything else Just five forever. weeks, that's all you need. Just five. Um, no, of course not. There's so much more. This is not an exhaustive list. These are just principles that we have found, we've tried to distill down, that have been hugely significant for our relationship and yeah. for other relationships with our kids, with our coworkers, with our friends and family, um, to help us grow into cultivating healthy and whole relationships. Because as we'll talk about, relationships are really important. There are a couple practical reasons why we wanna do a series like this. Anna, maybe you can offer the practical reasons. I'll do the practicals. You can hit us with the theologicals. I got the theologicals. Perfect. Got All the right. theologicals. Practical reason number one, why are we doing this series? Relationships are central to all of our lives. Every single person in this room is in relationship. In fact, as human beings, we're born into relationships, completely dependent creatures on relationships. As a mom of a two and a three-year-old, I can attest, they are helpless. Many of you in this room that are like, my 18-year-old is helpless, <laughs> right? We are relational people, and it's not just a caregiver, but we get older, and it's, it's peers, it's coworkers, it's bosses, it's friends, it's all sorts of relationships. So it is vital, we're all in them. It's central to our lives. Number two, relationships are really hard. Say it for the people in the back. Not this one. This has been the easiest relationship <laughs> of my one. entire life. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I say in complete jest, sometimes the closest relationships to us are the most difficult, are the hardest. I remember distinctly the first time in my cognitive memory that I knew that relationships were difficult. It was in preschool. My best friend Delaney and I were on the playground and it almost turned physical. Wow. The level of like, ugh, because we couldn't agree on who got to be the yellow Power Ranger. Now that'll do it, that'll break up marriages Which, right there. If you were a baby of the late 80s, early 90s, you know exactly what I'm talking about. The boys got red, green, blue, black, the girls had pink and yellow. So stereotypical. No one wanted to be pink, and we all fought over the yellow, but the, it was, there's conflict, there's conflict. It's hard, okay? So that's another reason we wanna talk about that. And then the third is that uh, there's huge 
social shifts happening. We've, we've talked about this a lot from up here, especially with our social media, the internet. There's a disengagement of true relationships that we're actually in. We get to be behind a computer screen and um, we get to kind of keep ourselves in echo chambers around people who only look and think and act exactly like we do so that we're not challenged, so we don't have to move into those uncomfortable spaces. I remember at the beginning of the internet, the scariest thing was if you're being catfished. Remember, there's a whole TV show on if the person over there was who they say they are. But I don't think that's the scariest thing anymore. To be honest, I think the most terrifying thing about it is I don't think we know who we are anymore because we get to be highlight reels of ourselves. We get to put only the best and the greatest parts of ourselves out there and we've lost touch with, is that really me? And so I think that this series is vitally important, uh, practically speaking, for those reasons. And then yeah. you tell us why theologically I mean, we can important. see ourselves in all those practical reasons. Theologically, I don't have too much to add, but what I do, I think, is really important. Uh, the first reason why we need to do a series on relationships is because, believe it or not, God is relationship. I don't know if you knew that. God is relationship. So in John 1, uh, John 1 verse 1, in the prologue, the very opening to John's gospel, we read, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, interesting about that passage, um, scholars and pastors, they, when, when he says Word, he's referring to Jesus, the second person, the Trinity. But notice, notice the grammatical construction. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It's this idea that Jesus was both with the Father but they also were one. You see this, you see it all throughout the scriptures, getting at this, this really important concept for us that our maker, our creator, the ground of existence, the source of all being is triune, is trinity. One God and three persons. This is the way Augustine puts it in his very famous and very dense, which I would not recommend, book on the trinity. But here's how he puts it easily for us. He goes, let us seek to understand that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are a trinity of persons related to each other and a unity of equal being. E unity of equal being, they are one, but they are in three persons. That might be boggling your mind a little bit. Basically, the source of yours and my existence is perfect, whole relationship. But that's not all. God, it isn't just that God is relationship. Another reason why we need to talk about him is because you and I are made in God's image. So Genesis 1, verse 26, God says, let us make mankind in our image. And so in the image of God, he made them. You and I are made in the image of perfect relationship. And if that wasn't enough, it's really interesting. In Genesis 1 and 2, the creation story, God creates the cosmos, the stars, he creates the, uh, the sun and the moon. He creates the wildebeest. He creates the blueberry bushes. It's all good, and he says it. After everything, that's good, that's good, that's good. Then he creates us. He creates humans, and he says, that's very good. That's very good. Do you know the first thing that's called not good in God's creation? Genesis 2.18. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. The first thing that God looks at in the world and says, this is not good, is when we're alone, when we're not in relationship. I will make a helper suitable. That word is Ezra Konegdo. You've probably seen some tattoos with that before. Really big in the early 2000s, really big. Hold on to that word. We're gonna come back to it later. But really what he's getting at, he goes, I'm gonna make a strong savior. I'm gonna make a strong helper who kind of, mirrors him, corresponds to him, is equal to him in likeness and strength and substance. I'm gonna make an Ezra Konegdo. So God is relationship. We're made in his image so much so that the first thing that's not good is when we're alone. And the last reason is Jesus did relationship really well. I think one of the things that we're super compelled by when we look at Jesus in the gospels, he was just great at relationship. Like man, dude never seemed to have a bad day. How did he do that? Like he was always gracious. And even when he had a rebuke, the rebuke was like balanced. You know, it was, it was well measured, it was well timed. You could still feel love in it. He was just really good. He called 12 around him. He equipped them and empowered them. They loved him. 
He forgave them. We're told that even after he resurrects and ascends, he gives his spirit to the church. The church is his body. Notice the, the, the logic there. We are the body of Christ, one body, many members. We're in a relationship now. Jesus just did relationships so well. So for all these reasons, both practically and theologically, we need to talk about relationships. We need to talk about what it means to never walk alone, to cultivate healthy and whole relationships. So with that, Anna, with that in mind, yes. we got five principles. We yes. have people in the room who, let's be real, who are like asking questions about their marriage, about how to make it stronger, who are asking questions about their 18-year-old children and like what's going on or, or any age, or asking questions about colleagues and all sorts of questions for their relationships. What is the first and most important principle that we can give them for how they can cultivate healthy and whole relationships? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You gotta get to know God. That seems counterproductive. Yeah, right, I know. So we just said, hey, these relationships here, the marriage, the kids, I'm not even talking to my parents right now, Anna. My coworker and I, we are like at odds. Like my kids, whoo, I love them, but I don't like them. And you're saying that the first principle in cultivating those healthy relationships is actually getting to know God? That's what we're saying. That's what we're saying. That's what we're saying. Here's why. One, if you are in this room today and you call yourself a follower of Jesus, you, you profess that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, it is vital that our first and most important relationship is with the living God of the universe, that we cultivate that one first and foremost. I mean, we could have an entire sermon series about why that is to, to be like Jesus, be with Jesus, do what Jesus did. I see what you did there. That was good. Anybody catch that? Huh? If you're new with us, we just went through a discipleship series that talked exactly about this, what it is to be with Jesus, to be in relationship, be like him and do as he did. So if you missed that, this point is real short because we just talked about that. Go back to our YouTube page, watch it. It's so good, it's so rich. But that relationship isn't important just in and of itself. This relationship informs all of our relationships. There is something that happens when we come into the presence of God, when we are transformed by the living God that affects every relationship we're in. And as Russ just mentioned, Jesus, he did relationships really well. So let's just, as an example, look at the life of Jesus as he walked on this earth in the four gospels. How do we see him going to be with God that informs then how he interacts with people? In preparation, we often see him preparing. Uh, at the beginning of Mark's gospel, before he even starts his ministry, he's literally baptized, and then he goes away for 40 days to be alone with God. Before he preaches the Sermon on the Mount, arguably his most profound and important sermon, he goes away from everybody to be alone and to be with God. He needed to prepare, prepare for relationship. He needed to rest and recover. Uh, in uh, Mark's gospel, we're told that after he had a full day of healing people, of exercising demons, he was exhausted. So the next morning, I would, I would have slept in probably. Yeah, definitely. He didn't do that. Right. He woke up early in the morning by himself. He went to a lonely place and he went with his father. Rest and recovery. Relationships are hard work. <laughs> They're laborious work. We need to rest and recover. For resilience and stamina, this sounds redundant, but basically in Luke's gospel, uh, when we're in chapter five, we see that the ministry is increasing. There's more demand on him. More people are coming. It's exciting. It's good. It's God's work. But as the increase in the demand for him and his attention happens, we are told in Luke's gospel that he now often withdraws to lonely isolated, secret places to be with God. And the reason that he needs to do this is he needs endurance and stamina. And I don't know about you, but I can personally tell you in my life when things start to get a little harried and more is being asked of me, oftentimes my spiritual life does not increase at a level that can sustain that. And I feel that, I wear that. We need to increase both those quiet places as the outward uh, demand on our life, even if it's good things, increases as well. Wisdom and counsel. We're told before he selects his uh, 12 disciples in Luke's gospel that he spends the entire night in prayer. Wisdom, discernment, relationships take a lot of both of those things. And then in grief, in grief and in comfort, in Matthew's gospel, after Jesus hears about the buffeting of his friend John the Baptist, he gets into a boat and he goes to be alone, to be with his father, to be with the living God because he's grieving. He needs to mourn. 
There's a lot of grief in this room. There's mourning, there's discomfort, there's agony. In fact, the greatest agony of Jesus we can see in the Garden of Gethsemane as he is preparing himself to not just be tortured, to not be crucified, but to be abandoned, to be betrayed, to be left by everybody that he has loved and poured his life into. And what do we see? Prayer, prayer. God, be with me. Father, your will be done. Empower me. There's a lot of those things in this room. And we look at Jesus' life, he goes to be with God. And there's a really key reason why that is. We know in the book of Galatians that the fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. And when we come into those quiet, sacred places with God, we allow the gifts of the Holy Spirit to take root, to be formed in and through us. And I don't know about you, but I need all of those gifts for the relationships that I encounter. I mean, patience right now. As a mom, I thought I was a very gentle, kind person until I became a mom, okay? And now I can tell in my body if I have not gone to that secret place with my Lord, I come down and I'm a different mom. I'm a different wife. Do you, do you, I don't can know what the right answer is. What's the right answer? <laughs> I will out myself. I am cranky. I am grouchy. My cup has not been filled. Those fruits have not had time to be formed in me. But when I sit in that quiet place, when I cultivate that relationship, it's not about knowing about God, guys, and that's the important part. We can read all the books. I've read books about prayer that are profound and deeply impacted me, but it's not until I sit and pray yeah. and experience. I know God, I don't know about him, I know him. I change the relationships in my life, they change. That's so good, I mean, it is. It's tempting for us to look at the life of Jesus and be like, well, of course he does perfect relationships, he's Jesus. Sure. And we miss exactly what you're saying, that he was constantly withdrawing to be with God, that the, the spirit in that relationship birth fruit in him as well that allowed him. You know, I was thinking about this. Um, recently, I was on a call with uh, some of my <laughs> colleagues, so I also help plant churches with our denomination all across the country, and I was on a call with some of my colleagues. And uh, it was just one, it was just a, like a lot of different people were having a bad day. Our son has a book right now that he loves. It's called The No, No, No Day. And basically, it's this little girl really from start to finish just has a bad day, just a no, no, no kind of day. It's too hot, it's too cold, it's too itchy, yeah. I don't like it. Uh, just uh, no, no, no. Yeah. It just felt like one of those. And we were sort of, we could feel in our, even our team irritation grow and we lacked patience, we lacked love or peace or any of those fruits. And uh, I was kind of joking, I was like, man, gosh, what do we do? And my colleague, totally without irony and, and so gently and, and I don't think she realized how profound she was being. She goes, we see them through the cross. And I was like, cool, okay, let's go to church right now. Yeah, <laughs> see them through the cross. But she was absolutely right. We see people through what Jesus has done. We come to Jesus. And so we did, we, we paused, we just prayed. We just opened our hearts. We said, Lord, forgive us of our irritation. Forgive us of our short-sightedness. We need you, Lord to help us to love others, to be in good and healthy relationship with others. And we said amen, and at least in that moment, there was more peace in our spirit and in our team. Mm -hmm. There was more joy, there was more patience, there was more self-control. So you see that happening in, in real ways. One of my favorite scriptures that gets at this, it's actually from Matthew chapter 11. So Jesus is talking to the crowds and he says, come to me, so this invitation, come to me. All you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, what's so fascinating about this, this passage, when it says, I will give you rest, the Greek word for that, which I talked about a couple months ago, is anaposo, anaposo. And two things about that I find so interesting. The first is when you read that word in other Grecian writings, it often has a connotation of like a, an army pursuing its enemy. They're pursuing, they're in battle, they're pursuing their enemy, and then the general says, stop, anapaso, stop. And they just flop on the grass and they rest, they make a fire, they drink some water, they rest. 
Sometimes it feels like the relationships we're engaging in, <laughs> sometimes it feels like we're pursuing enemies, doesn't it? Sometimes it feels like, gosh, this is a war, this is a battle, this is hard. And Jesus' invitation is stop, rest. Stop pursuing. Just hold on, take a breather. Come to me and rest. And the second thing which is really interesting about that word anaposo is it's a verb. So a better translation, though it would be more awkward, is if he said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will rest you. I will rest you. And the reason why it's a better translation is because when we read, I will give you rest, it almost feels like rest is something separate from Jesus. Like we come to him, he gives us the rest, and he says, all right, you're on your own, good luck. Have at it. Mm -hmm. No, 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 when he says, I will anapostle you, I will rest you, there is no rest outside of the presence of Jesus. Jesus is our rest. So in essence, what he's saying to us is, I know relationships feel hard. I know you have all sorts of questions. Stop, come to me, stop, and I, my presence will rest you. My presence, in the same way that we see Jesus going into the presence of the Father, and the Father resting him, and growing those fruits, and allowing him to enter into relationship and healthy in whole ways. He's saying the same thing to us. Come to me, I will rest you, and I will give you the strength you need. I will give you a light yoke and an easy burden for the life that I've called you to live. Mm -hmm. But maybe you're here and you're like, all right, that sounds great, but how do we do that practically? Mm -hmm. How do we practically stop and come to Jesus so that we can be rested by him for the relationships. Anna, how do we do that practically? You find your prayer apron. I'm gonna need you to say some more about that. I don't know what that means. Did you get it? No. If you were here a couple weeks ago, you heard Russ talking about a woman named Susanna Wesley. She lived back in the 17th century. She had 19 children. Oh, bless Woo. her sweet little loins. <laughs> Goodness sakes, and my belly hurts. Um, 19 children, but one of her children was John Wesley. He's the founder of Methodism, the Methodist Church. And uh, she, loved, she loved the Lord. And uh, her children, there's stories talking about how she had this apron in the kitchen that when she needed to be with Jesus, she just pulled that apron up and over her head and she was in her quiet place. And if the kids saw mama in her apron, you don't mess with mama in her apron because she's meeting with Jesus right now, okay? We find our prayer apron. Where is that sacred space for us? I've got a, a corner in my bedroom. It's my bedroom. It's where I sleep. There's nothing special about that space, but I have allotted a corner where I have a desk and a lamp, and I put verses up on the wall, and occasionally I like to journal my prayers, and if there's a prayer that just feels like it's an evergreen that the Lord is gonna be speaking over me in this season, I'll rip it out and I'll tack it up there so I see it, and I remember. There's nothing special about that space per se, but when I come into it, I say, Jesus, I'm coming expectant. I am coming expectant that you're gonna meet with me and I know that you're gonna meet with me here in this place. It becomes holy ground. It could be a chair. It could be a room. It could be a closet. Oh man, there's a closet under my stairs that I would love to lock myself in without my children and be like, this is mama's prayer room, okay? It could be a drive. It could be somewhere that you go and you overlook a beautiful viewpoint. Find your sacred space. That is an anointed holy space for you to meet and then you practice silence and sol solitude, which we have talked about silence and solitude so much this year. We're gonna keep year. talking about it. We're gonna keep talking about it because there is something so deeply profound. I love the way uh, Henry Nouwen puts it. He says, solitude is the furnace for transformation. Is there anything warm and cuddly about the sound of a furnace? <laughs> no, of course not. It is deeply uncomfortable. I get it. Uh, I haven't, I've known about solitude and silence for many, many years. It's not something that I've really taken seriously until the last couple of years, and I feel when I lack it. There is a fire there, there is deep uncomfort. We've talked a lot about when you get quiet, how there's a lot of stuff that starts to come up that you'd rather be like, no, 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 let's stuff that down, turn on the noise, turn on the distraction. It is so vitally important because that's where transformation comes, and oftentimes we need to remove all those voices that try to speak to us. We even need to remove the language of our own mouths. Prayer is wonderful and God wants us to commune with him. But when we come silently and we sit, our soul mm. meets with God. 
and his soul meets with ours, and that transcends sometimes our limited vocabulary of what we're able to say. In fact, in, in 1 Kings 19, 11, the Lord is speaking to Elijah, and this is what we read. The Lord said, go out and stand on the, me- on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains um, apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And then the wind, after the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and he went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. I want the mountains. <laughs> I want the earthquakes. Lord, speak to me. If you tore that mountain down, I'd follow you. Sure, yeah. He speaks often in a whisper. He wants us to clear away the distraction so he can have our undivided attention in those places. And the third thing that we do is we practice gratitude, which I know for some of us sitting in here that are in really painful, uncomfortable uh, relationships that don't seemingly right now have any easy answer or quick solution, gratitude, that seems... uh, trite or what's that gonna do, but there is something that happens when we proclaim the goodness that transcends our understanding. In Philippians 4 we read, rejoice in the Lord always. I say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all that the Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and your minds in Christ Jesus. And in this context here, it's not saying don't, you can't be anxious. Anxieties rise up in us. They're unavoidable with things. There's a lot of things vying for our attention. Anxiety will come. We don't rest in those places. We don't become harried people. We put them at the feet of Jesus and say, take my anxieties. Because I know in return, you give me a peace that transcends my understanding. Notice he doesn't say, I will fix your problems. Come to me and rejoice and I will fix all your problems. No. But he will give us a peace that allows us to enter into relationships knowing whose we are. And we give thanks to God because he is good in all seasons, in all circumstances. So we just proclaim truth. We say, God, take my, take my anxieties and I proclaim that you are good. And I rejoice and I give thanks. And there is science behind gratitude, you guys. I love this. Dr. Um, Robert Emens, he's the world's leading scientific expert on gratitude. He's spent decades studying gratitude. And oftentimes he does these studies with prayer jur- uh, gratitude journals and other forms of gratitude, often taking test subjects through it for just three weeks. And I've distilled a whole list down to just a couple of the things that they have found after these tests. Practicing gratitude, physically, stronger immune systems, lower blood pressure, you sleep longer, you feel more refreshed. Psychologically, higher levels of positive emotions, more alert, alive, awake, more joy, pleasure, more optimism and happiness. And get this, socially, relationally, what we're talking about today, more helpful, generous, compassionate, more forgiving, more outgoing, you feel less lonely and isolated. Mm. I mean, man, isn't God so cool that he gets to work through science and scripture and the two come together that we say there's something to this. So again, find your prayer apron, practice solitude and silence, and practice gratitude. That's how we do it. That's how we come into the presence of the very invisible but very present God of yeah, the universe. That's awesome. that's awesome. And now, why did God design it this way? Maybe coming back to where we started. Mm-hmm. We're saying, hey, this is a series on relationships. This is a series on how we can cultivate healthy and whole relationships. And the first thing we're saying, the most important principle, is that we get into the presence of God. We come to the presence of Jesus. We get to know Jesus. That that actually will birth in us the fruit that we need, the fruit of the Spirit, to help us engage in healthy ways our other relationships. Why did God design it this way? I wanna go back to Genesis and come back to the Ezra Konegdo. I told you I was coming back to it. So again, in the beginning, God creates the man, the human, Adam, and puts him in the garden. And the first thing that's not good is that the human is alone. It's not good for the, for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. And Ezra Konegdo. Well, he can't find that helper. Adam can't find it. And eventually God decides to put him to sleep and take a rib out of Adam and fashion that rib into another human. 
And then when Adam awakes and he sees her, he goes, oh my gosh, this is it, at last. This is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for out of man she was taken. Now there's some interesting things happening in the original language, and namely this. The word that is used all throughout the story to describe Adam is the Hebrew word, go figure, Adam. <laughs> and Adam, it means man, but it has a broader sense. It really means human, the human being, the Adam. And then when God finally pulls the rib out and makes Eve, and Adam sees her, he goes, this is a bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, and the Hebrew word is isha, for out of man, ish, she was taken. This is the first time that he refers to himself as man in the story. Up till this point, it's been Adam. What's happening? Namely this. We have one human, one concept, category, the human. But from this, God creates two different types of humans, man and woman and puts them in relationship. And it's the relationship that makes them not alone. It's as if God is saying, the whole is more than the sum of its parts. It's as if God is doing the exact same logic, which is the very triune life. One God, three persons. One category of human, two distinct types that in relationship make the loneliness go. Now, maybe you're listening to this point, you're like, you guys tricked us. This is a marriage series. Because right after that passage, we're told in Genesis, it says, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will be one flesh. You're like, this is a marriage series. And you're wrong. On a pause, so stop. <laughs> because when we get to the New Testament, we see something really interesting. The first thing we see is that Jesus was a single guy. Anybody wanna say that Jesus didn't know how to do healthy and whole relationships or that Jesus was lonely? Nope. Jesus knew God. We also see that the Apostle Paul, who wrote over half of the letters in the New Testament, was a single guy. And here's what we learn from the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Ephesians. He's giving advice to married couples. He's giving marriage advice. In the middle of this advice, this counsel, he actually refers back to the Genesis story. He's talking about how men, husbands and wives should treat one another and he goes, it's just like in Genesis, for this reason, a man will leave his father and his mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, he says. Notice that next part. But I am talking about Christ and the church. Do you know what Paul is getting at? He's saying that all of our relationships, whether marriages or otherwise, they, they are not the, the highest goal. They're actually an icon that reveals to us the most perfect and final relationship that we were all made for. The one relationship that makes the aloneness go away. And that relationship, says Paul, is between Jesus and the church. My friends, Jesus is our true Ezra Konegdo. Jesus is the helper, the strong savior who corresponds to us. We might even say, if I can stretch the metaphor a little bit further, that Jesus is God taking a rib and fashioning it into one just like us, that Jesus is the, the, the man who leaves father and mother and comes to the earth and unites with us and makes us one flesh with God. See, the whole point of the biblical story is whether we're single or whether we're married or whatever relationships we find ourselves in, ultimately, where the loneliness stops, where our souls, who our souls were made for, is the very presence of God revealed in Jesus Christ. And it's in that relationship first, first, not exclusively, but first, it's in that relationship where we find our wholeness that then allows us, as Jesus will tell us, to love the Lord your God with all your being and to love your neighbor as yourself. Mm -hmm. Whew, y'all need a breath, fresh air? I do, let's take a breath. Whew. This is gonna be a really fun five weeks, you guys. I'm really excited. Um, I'm actually gonna invite the band back up and I'm gonna end with a story. 
Uh, this is not my story, it's actually a story by uh, Max Lucado. Many of you probably know him. He's a really famous author that's done an incredible job uh, writing some uh, really powerful books and uh, really powerful children's books. And one of them is called You Are Special. Anybody ever read You Are Special in here? Oh man, you guys. Okay, this is the gist of it. There is a little town that's got a village of all these wooden puppets, they're called Wimmicks, okay? And all of the Wimmicks have these little boxes and they're allowed to go around, they have uh, gold stars and black dots on the inside of them. And they go around to the other Wimmicks and they give them stars or dots based on if they are lovely and they do nice things. They get, they get stars if they're talented or, or gifted or uh, graceful. And if they're not so pretty or if their paint is chipping or if they're clumsy, they get dots not completely unlike our like and dislike system of social media today, right? And there's a little Wimmick named Punchinello and he is clumsy and he's not very pretty and he's, his paint is scratched and he tries to do wonderful things and every time he tries, he falls down and he gets more scratches and he's got a lot of dots, a lot of dots. He's got so many, he doesn't even wanna go outside anymore. He wants to be in isolation because he feels like he's just covered in dots. What does he have to offer? And he meets another Wimmick and she has no dots. She also has no stars. And he's curious and he starts talking to her. Why, why is that? And she says, because I go and I sit with Eli. Eli is the carpenter who lives up on the top of the hill. You should go and meet with him. And so he's really hesitant and he's nervous. I don't, I don't know, why would, would he want to talk to me? And he finally summons up the nerve and he goes up and he opens the door into Eli's wood shop. And Eli looks down, Punchinello, I'm so glad to see you. And he says, you know me? Of course I know you, I made you, you're mine. I've been waiting for you. And they have this, oh, beautiful, conversation in which Punchinello is trying to understand, I met this girl and, and the, the dots, the, the stars, they don't stick to her, why? And he says, they only stick if you care about them, but the more you trust my love for you, the less you will care about them. And he goes, I, I'm not sure I understand. He said, you will, but it's gonna take time because you got a lot of dots. And as Punchinello is ending the conversation and he's walking out of the wood shop, Eli, the creator, he says, Punchinello, you remember, you are special because I made you and I don't make mistakes. And as Punchinello is leaving, we get to hear his inner thoughts. And he says, you know, I think he means that. And as he walks out, one dot falls to the ground. I don't know why this is a children's book. It should be on all of our bookshelves. <laughs> Guys, this is good stuff. <laughs> this is profound. Because we want to be people who do not wear the world, but we radiate our maker. Amen. Because our maker says, I made you, I know you, and I don't make mistakes. Punchinello still went back into the village. He's still engaged in relationships. We don't avoid relationship as we just learned God created us for relationship, but he did not make us to wear the world's expectations, to wear the dots, to wear the stars. He didn't make us for that. He made us to be in relationship with him, to sit in his presence, in his wood shop, just having a conversation, getting to know him, getting to know ourselves so that when we walk out, we engage in relationships in a way that we, what? We don't wear the world, we radiate our maker. It's back to um, Matthew 11, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. We are burdened in this room. There are some of us that are wearing way too many dots right now, way too many dots and they do not belong there and they may not all fall off at once. It'll take time. It's gonna take time to trust and believe. But there's also people in this room and you might be wearing too many stars and they cling to you and they're your identity. And without them, who are you? You are a creation of the creator who says you are special because I made you that way. So this space, this room, this is a place that we come because he invites us. He says, come to me, lay your burdens, lay your dots. Lay your stars, because my, my yoke is easy, my burden is light, come to me, come to me. Let us pray. Yeah, stand to our feet. And we're gonna say a word of prayer. And in just a second as we pray, I'm gonna invite, if there's anyone in the room who just this message, this idea of Jesus saying, come to me. And as you come, those dots and stars will fall. 
know you have all sorts of questions about your relationships, but make my relationship with you first and foremost. If that's you, whether for the first time or you're like, I need to respond again, I'm gonna invite you as we pray just to slip your hand into the air so that I can pray over you as well. And then after we say amen, we're gonna sing a song or response and we're gonna come to the table in the front or in the back that has communion. It's gluten-free communion. Um, just need to throw that one out there. And uh, this, this communion, it represents us making this relationship first and foremost, that Jesus gave his life for us so we give our lives for him and receive it as the most important. If you wanna come to the altar and kneel, please come to the altar and kneel. If you wanna sing out loud, sing out loud. If you wanna pray, pray. So let's close our eyes and let's posture our hearts in a word of prayer. And if that's you, if this message, you sense the Lord stirring in you, and you just wanna respond and say, Lord, I'm here, my relationships are hard, but I hear your invitation to come to you and to be rested by you and to let you remove the stars and the dots, just slip your hand into the air. And I just wanna pray over you specifically. And so Jesus, for these hands in the air, these people who are acknowledging they need to come to you, they want to, they desire it. In the same way that we sang at the very beginning, they're making space. They're making space, they're coming. God, remove those dots, those words, those vicious words that were spoken, those memories that they can't get rid of, remove those dots. And God, the stars, remove those too. What is the praise of man? when we can have the words of our Father. I pray in this next bit of time, God, that they would sense your overwhelming love for them, that they would sense the words of Scripture that say, I made you, and I made you for myself. I made you for myself, and your heart will be restless until it finds its rest in me. So Lord, I pray that they would believe that, just like little Punchinello, that they would believe that, that you have made them for yourself. In this next bit of time, God, as we respond, all of us in this room, as we respond to you, open our hearts and minds, open our bodies to the reality of your spirit's presence. We come to you, Jesus. We come to you. It's in your name pray. Amen.